good evening, Castle Hill Baptist Church, and uh, a special warm welcome to anyone who may be tuning in uh, who is not from the church. Uh, we send our warm greeting to you. Uh, for those of you who uh, may not know me, my name is Nathan and I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, so again, let me extend a warm greeting to you and we're thankful that you can uh, tune in with us at this time. Uh, for those of you who didn't uh, hear the announcement this morning uh, in the AM service, uh, the elders had uh, have met together and there has been the decision to reopen and this will be uh, commencing uh, October the 11th and we will be going uh, to uh, aim for opening all three services as per uh, usual, obviously with limitations. So for the meantime, it's still a few weeks away, uh, but we'll keep you posted with how planning and preparations go. Uh, but good news on that front uh, that we are planning to uh, reopen for uh, attendance uh, very soon. Well, tonight we continue our uh, study in Joshua. Now, the passage that we're up to uh, tonight is very different to the previous six chapters we have looked at. Uh, it's really a very different chapter to anything we've seen so far. Uh, because for the first six chapters, uh, we've seen Israel obedient, Israel faithful. We've seen God's blessing lavished upon them. They've had joy. They've had success. It has been wonderful to see. Chapter 7, we get the absolute opposite. It is to contrast night and day. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, uh, please open up to Joshua chapter 7. It would be really great if you could follow along, if you could have it open uh, to follow the reading, because through the sermon, I won't be able to read and reference every single verse. So to see what's going on in the story, please follow along uh, now in Joshua chapter 7. But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Kami, son of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them, so the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, to the east of Bethel, and told them, Go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the people will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not weary all the people, for only a few men are there. About three thousand men went up. They were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about thirty-six of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we'd been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. O oh Lord, what can I say? Now that Israel has been routed by its enemies, the Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this and they'll surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? Then the Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They've put it the, with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Go, consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. That which is devoted is among you. O Israel, you cannot stand against your enemies until you remove it. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe that the Lord takes shall come forward by clan by clan. The clan that the Lord takes shall come forward family by family. And the family that the Lord 
Take shall come forward man by man. He who is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. Early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes and Judah was taken. The clans of Judah came forward and he took the Zerahites. He had the clan of the Zerahites come forward uh, by families and Zimri was taken. Joshua had his family come forward man by man, and Achan, son of Kami, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give him the praise. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold wedge, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys and sheep, his tent and all that he had to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him. And after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. Over Achan they heaped a large pile of rocks which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore that place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. This is the word of the Lord. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you and We just thank you that we can have this time to open your word. Your word is precious. I pray that we would treat it as precious at this time. I pray that you would reveal it to us, please, by the Holy Spirit. Illuminate what your word says, that we might understand it, comprehend it. I pray that we would revere your word. Lord, please give us the ears to hear that we need. God, please give us a sensitive heart to be responsive to what you say to us tonight. Lord, we want to honor you. We want to glorify you. We are not unaware that Christ is the one who inspects the health of his churches. I pray that as he examines us, even tonight, may you do a great work in each individual who is listening. I pray that you would show us the things that you want us to see Please give grace to me to speak and to hear myself. And please give grace and mercy to those who are listening. And I pray all of this for the sake of your son, the head of the church, the Lord of the church. Amen. Well, this is the passage that we have to uh, look at tonight. Just summarizing verses 2 to 5, they are familiar if we have been reading Joshua so far. It's Joshua continues his normal pattern for conquest and he sends spies out uh, to search out and look at the land of Ai, the city of Ai. They find, the spies uh, bring a report that the city is much smaller than they had expected, far smaller uh, than Jericho. And the spies report back, there's so few number in I, we only need to send two to 3,000 troops there. Joshua sends 3,000. But when they get there, The men of Ai attack them. The Israelites are fleeing for their lives. And as they're running away, it says about 36 men of the Israelites were killed. And all of this happens on the heels of the event of Jericho when God brought that mighty great city down. The walls came tumbling down and Israelites destroyed them. And yet this small city, the opposite happens. Now notice the effect that this news of, the, of Israel running away and 36 dying. Look at the effect it has on the whole nation. Verse 5. 
They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. This is the great reversal that's happened because back in chapter 2, Rahab said all the people in, in Jericho and all the people in Canaan, they've heard about Yahweh. They're so terrified that their hearts are melting like wax. And here, the complete opposite happens. Now, God's people... Their hearts are melting like wax and they're terrified of the people surrounding them. Notice the grief that this brings to Joshua and the elders. Verse 6, Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. Joshua was on his face till evening, head on the ground. And it says he tore his clothes in absolute distress. This is the same thing that Job did when he found out all of his children were killed. He tore his clothes in agony and grief. And look how look at his uh, painfully distressing prayer to God. Verses 7 to 9. And Joshua said, Ah, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Ammonites to destroy us? If only we'd been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what can I say now that the Israelites have been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country, they'll hear about this and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. And then what will you do for your own great name? You see, Joshua is distraught. He, he cannot believe it. God promised him, I will be with you. Wherever you go, I will give you success. I will give you this land. I will put your enemies into your hands. Do not worry. Just be courageous. I will do all of it. And now it seems that God has broken his promises. He lets Israel be defeated. 36 of them are killed and they're running for their lives and they retreat. Look at the change that's just happened in Joshua's life. Look at the previous verse to our chapter, the one that led into this verse. Chapter 6 ends this way, verse 27. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the land. Now look at verses uh, 7 of chapter 7, verses 8 and 9. We're running for our we're running for our lives. And 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 they're gonna wipe our names from the earth. There is just a complete change here. You see, the cities are going to hear about this, how we ran with our tail between our legs. They're all going to get courage that we can be defeated and they're all going to swarm us. And on top of that, on top of that, your great name's going to be dishonored. Your, your reputation's going to be at stake. And Joshua looks at this defeat and he sees it as if God has broken his promise. Joshua is saying to God, crying in prayer, You said, you said, you promised, you who cannot lie, you promised. And here we are. Joshua is beside himself as Israel runs for their lives. What's going on here in the story? Well, when I was preparing for this message, I found myself extremely frustrated as I was reading some of the comments that people have written and made about this passage. People look at and explain what's going on here and they look at verses 2 to 5 of Joshua's battle plan and strategy and they criticize Joshua and they say, this happened because Joshua didn't pray. Joshua uh, had pride from their previous victory and he just sends men out for battle. He didn't ask God what God wanted. And the spies, they were so overconfident. They said, we only need a few thousand men and they were walking in pride. And you know the saying, pride goes before a fall. Well, I think this is absolutely the wrong interpretation. Israel were defeated because God was angry He wasn't angry at the spies' report. He wasn't angry at Joshua's conquest plans. Verse 1 tells us, But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. Achan took some of them, so the Lord's anger burned against Israel. You see, Joshua sent the spies, and then Joshua ended up sending his troops But he did all of that without the vital piece of information that we have in verse 1. 
Joshua acts and does his battle plan without knowing what the reader is privileged to know. He doesn't understand what's happened. He doesn't know that Achan took some of the devoted things. What are these devoted things? What's the problem here? Well, go back to chapter 6, verse 16. Uh, Verse 17 of chapter 6. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. And then verse 18. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. See, it's very clear instructions here, warning not to touch those things that God said, destroy them. And yet, despite these clear warnings and instructions, they disobey. Let me quote A.W. Pink here. He says this, As there was a serpent in Eden and a Judas among the apostles, so there was an Achan in the midst of an obedient Israel. Now, I want you to notice how the author describes the sin that happens here. And I want you to also notice how the author describes God's response to this sin. Who committed the sin? Achan did. Who does God direct the blame to? Look at verse 1. The Israelites acted unfaithfully. Who does God's anger burn against now? Look at verse 1. So the Lord's anger burnt against Israel. Do not miss the author's connection here between the one and the many. Achan's sin brought guilt on the whole community. One man did it and the whole community was brought under guilt and judgment of God. Now this leads us to our first point tonight. The first point is the sin of one brings corporate guilt. The sin of one brings corporate guilt. Israel were to be a holy people to the Lord, a holy community. And so the community is held responsible for breaching and violating their covenant with God. God's anger to the act of what Achan did is now directed to all of Israel. 36 men lose their lives and there are now potentially 36 widows in the camp grieving. You see, the point here, as you look at this, even as Christians, the 21st century Christianity that that we have today has no room for a theology like this. We are more individualistic than we have ever been. So the idea of God's displeasure being directed on a whole community because of one sin seems so Old Testament and so archaic. But let me ask you, have you never read in the New Testament Jesus' personal letters to local churches? To what we have recorded in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Jesus writes to seven local churches. Most of them had these little pockets, not the whole congregation, but little pockets of sin issues. For example, Thyatira, they tolerated and accepted a false prophetess. Others of the other local churches, they had some who tolerated sexual sin and other sinful practices. And Jesus writes to them and he says to the different congregations, this I have against you as a congregation. I have this against you. And he threatened the whole congregation. You see, today, much of the modern Christianity uh, attitude, the modern Christian's attitude seems to be this. It's nobody's business with what, what I choose to watch. It should be nobody's business with what I watch at home. It's nobody else's business how I raise my children, what I do and do not do. It's nobody else's business if I choose to be regular or re- irregular at church. It's nobody's business how I choose to live my life. To the contrary, church member listening it is absolutely all of our business how you choose to live because your sin affects all of us my sin affects us it says Achan took the devoted things the Lord's anger then burned against Israel that should make us tremble this reality and we'll see shortly as we move on that God has much more to say about this 
on the matter of corporate guilt. But if the problem here is if, if the congregation, if a local church doesn't take this seriously, if members are not held accountable, if members are not being vigilant in keeping watch over one another's spiritual health, then sinful practices and sinful lifestyles will be hidden and concealed and tucked away and the church will suffer. The congregation will suffer and yet... This leads to the next point I want us to see. Sin is never, ever hidden from God. Sin is never hidden from God. God responds to Joshua's confusion and distressed prayer. Look how God responds, verses 10 to 11. The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put uh, them with their own possessions. You see, what Joshua was clueless about, God knew. What was his, hidden from the camp of Israel was plain in God's sight. God said, Israel has taken things that they shouldn't have, that I commanded them not to, and they have hidden them. They've placed them among their own possessions. And what they've hidden from everyone is plain in my sight. I have seen it. It's not hidden from me. And there is great application here. Husband, are you living unfaithfully to your wife, flirting or in adulterous relationship? Wives, do you have a bitter root of resentment in your husband, unforgiveness towards your husband? Man, you who might even be single, do you walk an impure life? Do you, do you allow all sorts of addictions into your life? Mothers, fathers, do you encourage idolatry in your children by lavishing them with worldly things and filling their minds with worldly things? Church leader, would you be ashamed to have the internet search history on your phone or laptop displayed on this projector for all of us to see? Understand this. Understand, you may have tried to hide your nakedness and shame with the fig leaves of Eden, but you cannot remain hidden from God. He sees it. He sees absolutely all of it. Let me show you a few verses. Hebrews 4.13. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Proverbs 15.3, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. And what about our Lord Jesus Christ? What did he say in Luke chapter 12, verse 2? He says, there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed. What you said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. What you whispered behind closed doors will be shouted from the rooftops. Sin is never hidden from God. And God tells Joshua what Joshua didn't see. Joshua is in grief and God says to him, verse 10, get up. What are you doing with your face on the ground? God didn't want him and he didn't want Israel to lick their wounds. God wanted them to get up and deal with the sin in the camp. And this leads to our next point. The church dealing with sin in the camp. The church dealing with sin in the camp. Please, as we look at verse 12, read it very, very, very carefully. Listen very carefully to what we read in verse 12. God says, That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have become made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. This is, this is incredible. Two aspects of this verse here. Firstly, God says, 
You are running for your lives. I am not going out with you because Israel has now been made liable to destruction. Think about that for a second. What God is saying here. God said the things of Jericho, the people of Jericho, the possessions of Jericho, they were accursed by God and therefore Israel needed to devote them to destruction. But what happened? The things that were under God's curse and that needed to be destroyed, Israel took them and brought them into their camp and now Israel was under God's curse and now Israel needed to be devoted to destruction. Do you see that? How everything changed in a moment. This is incredibly, incredibly serious. And look how it intensifies in the second half of verse 12. Look what God also says. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever is among you devoted to destruction. Now God threatens the whole of Israel over the sin of one. He's saying, if the sin of one is not dealt with, then I walk away. I am not going with you and you'll be given over to destruction. Isn't that, isn't that profound? Isn't that shocking? And yet, this isn't just the way that God deals with people in Old Testament times. And do you object and say, God, God, doesn't, treat, God doesn't treat his people this way uh, today in the New Testament, the New Covenant? Let me be as clear as I possibly can in this moment. This is exactly the way God deals with local churches today and in the new covenant. Exactly. I mentioned earlier Revelation chapter 2 and 3 where Jesus writes seven personal letters to seven individual local churches. To local churches And a number of these churches had sinful practices in them going on. They had issues of sin going on. Now, I want you to note the parallels with what God says to Joshua and what God says to these local churches. Two covenants, look at the parallels. To Joshua, he said, I will no longer go with you and Israel if you do not deal with the sin. That's what he said to Joshua. Now look what God, uh, Jesus says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 5 to the local church at Ephesus. He says this, Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. This is a threat of warning. I will remove your witness. I'll remove your testimony to this world and I will withdraw myself from you as a congregation. Look what he writes, look what Jesus writes to the church at Pergamum, chapter 2, verses 14 to 15. Jesus writes this to this church. I have a few things against you. You have some who hold to the teaching of Balaam and some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against those of you with the sword of my mouth. God fights against the Israelites by using the men of I, and Jesus says, if you don't repent, I'm going to fight against you with the sword of my mouth, with my word and judgment. What about the congregation, the local church at Thyatira? Look what Jesus writes. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I'll make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches, all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and will pay and will repay each according to their deeds. Understand this. Holiness is of absolute importance in the life of a local church. Holiness in church matters. I could keep giving examples of what he says to Sardis and Laodicea. We could give examples of how he killed some of those in Corinth, some of those in that church. And we could even talk about how he killed Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. God's threat and warning to Israel is the same threat and warning that he gives local churches today. What was God's counsel to Joshua? Deal with the sin or my favor is withdrawn and harm will be for you. What is God's counsel to local churches? Exactly the same thing. Deal with the sin or harm will come. How do we deal with sin in our churches now? 
How do we do it? Well, this is church discipline. The Bible has much to say on this specifically, on the issue of church discipline. In, let me tell you just briefly what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18. He kicks it off in the New Testament. Jesus says, if you see your brother in sin, go and approach him. If he doesn't repent of that sin after you approach him, go and bring two and three others with you to talk to him about it. If he still refuses to repent after you approach him, bring it to the whole assembly and the whole assembly, that whole church must treat him as a Gentile tax collector, as an unbeliever. What else do we get on church discipline in the New Testament? Well, what Paul says to the Corinthians. I want to read this and please listen along carefully to what Paul says the Corinthian local church must do regarding sin that was happening in their, in their congregation. 1 Corinthians 5, I'll just read it. Paul says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans don't tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. And you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? For my part, even though I'm not physically present, I am with you in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. So... When you are assembled and I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave this world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. You expel the wicked person from among you. This is the same process. Jesus and Paul here are talking about the same thing that churches must do. When someone is caught in sin, a sinful practice, they're doing, they're living in disobedience. You have to go to that person and confront them. And, 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 and you want to try and restore that person. Show them from Scripture, you can't be doing this as a believer. Having Christ as Lord, you can't live this way. You want to see them turn. If they don't, you need to take other people with you. And sit them down and talk to them and try and turn them and to, and to have them repent and come back to Christ, as it were, in obedience. But if the, pers is, if the person is still unwilling to repent and stop the sin, then it needs to be brought to the whole church and the assembly needs to pronounce judgment and treat that person as an unbeliever. If they walk in these doors, we treat them as an unbeliever. They cannot participate in the Lord's Supper. They cannot serve and be active because they're an unbeliever in our eyes. This is what he says. You see, this is the common disease affecting virtually every church, every congregation. Sinful practices are rampant and like Achan and Israel, it says the sin, they hide it among their own belongings. What's it showing? That sin is tolerated and allowed to stay in the church. You see, the uncomfortable duty that churches have of, of exercising church discipline, this, this duty that we've been given by the Lord of the church, by the head of the church himself, is not practiced by his local churches today. Very rarely is it practiced. It's much easier not to do it. It's much more comfortable not to do it. And because so many of us are not doing it, the church has become crippled because of it. We have become like empty vessels. Yes, we might make a lot of noise in our services, but we're empty. We're empty. 
You see, when church discipline does not happen, when people are not confronted by their sin and told they need to repent and stop, when this doesn't happen, the Holy Spirit is grieved. Jesus withdraws, as he said, and God withholds his blessing and favor from that congregation and they become barren. Now, I've heard multiple times people say to me this, here at CHBC, the gospel is preached every single week. We always preach the gospel. It's always in the preaching. And yet we scarcely ever see a single conversion or a single person get saved. I want to throw the question out there. Could it be, could it be a possibility that God's blessing upon the proclamation of the gospel from this pulpit, week in and week out, his blessing has been withheld because of sin among us that hasn't been dealt with. And, and church discipline has not been undertaken when Christ requires it. Like he says to some of the local churches in Revelation, could it be possible that he could be saying to CHBC, this I have against you. And he lays out the certain sins that are happening. At the very least, at the very least, should we not fall down on our knees and pray and even ask God, is there something in the camp that you are displeased with? Are you withholding blessing because there is something that we are grieving you with? If it be the case, if there is sin that has been left unchecked, lifestyles going on that have been unchecked, then we can preach the gospel every week from this pulpit. Youth group can have the gospel preached to them every week. The children's ministry can have the word of God taught to them every week. And yet all of our labors will be in vain because God will withhold the blessing because we have forfeited his favor and his favorable presence. You see, this is the seriousness of the matter. One of the greatest preachers that the church has ever seen a dear man who, who's long since been gone, Robert Murray McShane, phenomenal preacher that the, that the Lord used. He only had a small congregation and he only lived to the age of 29, but God used him so mightily. And, and Robert Murray McShane, he said these words, my congregation's greatest need is my personal holiness. That's not legalism. Some of you hear that and you're, and, and you're almost disgusted by it. You think it's so legalistic. It's not legalism. It's not. Holiness is essential amongst, the God, amongst God's people. There are historical records of people who attended his church. And the historical records, when you read his biography, say this. That when he ascended the pulpit, before he even spoke a word, there are occasions when the congregation started weeping and were marveling because they felt and saw so strongly the presence of Christ upon him. Just looking at him, he was God's man because he took holiness seriously. He was God's man. And we need to take holiness seriously. And in our congregation, we need, we need people who are God's men, women who are God's women, who are holy in their conduct, who pursue righteousness and obedience to Christ. You see, if, if your pastors, if your pastors are looking at porn, if your pastors are getting drunk, if your pastors are given to worldliness and all of this is done in secret, you would not for a moment think that God would ever bless the preaching that goes out while they're doing that in secret. You wouldn't. And yet what do we see over and over in all of these verses that we looked at? God's blessing and favor upon local churches is not just withdrawn when ministers or leaders are caught in sin and are living in secret sin, but even when just members of the congregation are living in sin. Will we, will we take holiness seriously in this church? Personal holiness unto God. Will we take it seriously? We need to learn. We need to learn from Joshua. Look at, look at Joshua verses 13 to 15. Let me just summarize them. God tells the whole of Israel to prepare. The next day come, when, when it's the next day, 
in the morning, all of them will be required, all of Israel to assemble according to their tribes. God gives instructions. Tomorrow, make sure you're prepared. God is saying, prepare to meet your God tomorrow. I can only imagine that evening prior to that morning, there wouldn't have been much sleep in the Israelite camp. And if I can just summarize verses 16 to 18. The next morning arrives. All of Israel is summoned. They are, they are put in, in groups of their tribes, in the 12 tribes. And within those 12 tribes, people are, are set up according to their clan. They're standing according to their clans and their families. And God, instead of just revealing immediately who the culprit for the sin is, God goes through this slow, agonizing process of elimination. Why, 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 is he do, why does he go through this slow process to show what a fearful thing it is to fall into the hands of the living God, to show how serious sin is amongst God's people? And so what he does is he starts narrowing it down Fraction by fraction, all the 12 tribes are there. And then he chooses, he, he reveals which tribe has a sinner in it. Then he reveals which clan has a sinner in it. Then he reveals which family groups have the sinner in it. And then he calls Achan forward by name. Look at verses 19 to 21. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give him the praise. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I've done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. This is a complete full and honest confession. The confession ha happens after the process that God goes through. Achan doesn't come forward. God pulls him out. And notice here the pathway to sin. Do you see how detailed the wording is? Achan says, I saw. It was beautiful. I coveted it. I took it. And then I hid it. This is the path of sin. How much, how much trouble do we fall into because of undisciplined eyes? Undisciplined eyes. We allow our eyes to view so much. We watch so much and we look at so much that is dangerous. We put barely any filters upon us. And our eyes run us into trouble. You see, they, our eyes lock on to what our sinful natures crave. And then our eyes linger. And when our eyes linger, then our mind begins to contemplate. And our mind begins to fantasize. And then in that moment, our will acts. Performs a deed. You see, there is great application here. We need to guard our eyes. If we can learn anything from Achan... We need to guard our eyes. Look at Job. Look at Job, that righteous man. Look at his resolve. Job 31 verse 1. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully on a young woman. I made a covenant with my eyes. The psalmist in 119 verse 37 says this. Oh Lord, turn my eyes from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. What, what, what is the application? What is it teaching us? Guard your eyes. Live in his word. So Achan's stuff is all found in the tent. And then what? Well, all the gold and the robe and the silver, it's laid out, brought back before Joshua and all the Israelites. And it also says they spread it out before the Lord God, before God's eyes. And then what? What happens next is hard to stomach. Verses 24 and 25. Then Joshua together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold wedge, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys and sheep, his tent and all that he had to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him. And after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. 
he and his whole family, his whole family killed. And it seems that his family, his children and wife, they're killed. It seems that they knew about this sin too. What was concealed in their tent, they knew about it and, and were told to keep quiet. That's what's kind of implied here, I think, from the text. But his sin brings his family under the judgment of God and they're all killed. And instead, Joshua's concerned that God's name would be ruined. But instead of God's name being ruined, Achan's name is ruined. God destroys all of his future generations, kills all of his children as well. There is no name left for Achan. He's finished. And on top of this, God has all of Israel, all of Israel, the whole community, the whole camp, to participate in stoning them to death. God makes all of them participate in it. This is very severe. But does the punishment seem too severe? Does God seem to be overreacting? Does God seem to be harsh? Does this punishment almost seem to be immoral and unloving? Or could it be that our view of sin is nowhere near as it should be? You see, we... We shrug at sin. We shrug and are quite indifferent about it so much of the time. It says in the passage that God's anger burned against their sin. You see, we often are apathetic towards sin. Jesus was so serious about sin. He said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Do whatever you can to fight against sin that you won't fall into it and practice it. And so the passage ends with verse 26. Over Achan, they heaped a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, the place has been called the Valley of Achor, or trouble ever since. God has them set up a rock memorial. Does that remind you of anything that we saw a few weeks ago? When God brought them through the Jordan River, it was to show them how faithful he was and to them and faithful to his promises. So he gets them to take the rocks and build a memorial so they may always remember his faithfulness. Now he gets them to make another memorial, not to show his faithfulness, but to show his justice and anger against sin. And there's a rock pile over the corpses of Achan and his family. And it's to serve as a forever reminder that this is what happens when people choose sin over God and disobey and rebel. Another memorial is made. And these are the consequences for sin. And I ask you, is it worth, is it worth embracing and pursuing sin and living in it unrepentant? Is it worth it? It is to murder your soul. It was, sin is so deceptive. Is it worth it? Look how it deceived Achan. He says, I saw it and it was beautiful and he partook of it. And what was the end of his life? He and his family were stoned and burned. Sin is deceitful. You see, we are, even us as a new covenant community, we know as we read the New Testament, God doesn't call those who are, who are caught in unrepentant sin, he doesn't call us to stone them to death and kill them. We're not a theocracy anymore. But he commands us to deal with them and deal with their sin. And so as I close, as we saw with Achan and Israel, we saw also with the local churches that Jesus writes to in Revelation, we saw the same thing. Sin has many consequences and sin affects the body of Christ. It affects churches. It affects the local church. And so I'm putting this out there. If you... You who are a member, you who are part of this this church or whatever church you're from, are you living a double life? Are you living in sin? Are you not changing your ways? Are you disobedient to God? And yet while you're doing it, are you part of this congregation? Are you serving or just being part of it? Are you doing that? Because if you're doing that, your life contradicts your profession. If you're doing this, can I suggest two things? Two things. Firstly, I hope and trust that the Holy Spirit's convicting you. If this is you, you need to repent immediately and you need to plead and seek the mercy of God and you need to plead the blood of Christ upon you 
believe in Christ and he is able to forgive and cleanse for all those who confess their sin to him and believe and trust in him. That's what you need to do immediately. Secondly, can I exhort you from, from Scripture and what we've seen? If you're entangled in this double life, if you're living disobedient to God and yet you are playing church, can I exhort you to come and contact one of your pastors? Contact one of your elders and tell them what's going on for two reasons. One, so that we can come and help you, so that we can pray with you and so that we can help see you restored. But also... If you are active and you are serving and you are doing things, it might be that you need to be you need to step down from ministry. That there might need to be some things that are dealt with until this gets dealt with, until you have dealt with your sin and there has been a change, because your sinfulness and disobedient may be affecting greatly this congregation. And Jesus wants it to be pure. So can I encourage you with these things? I know this isn't a pleasant sermon tonight. I know it's not popular. But this is the word of God. This is what we have in Joshua chapter 7. And I trust, I trust at least some of you want CHBC to be a place that Christ is pleased to dwell and walk among and that he doesn't, a place that he doesn't withhold his favor and his blessing upon. That you want to see us grow and flourish in the will of God, growing spiritually. I trust that you want this. May the Lord work in us what he has revealed in this passage this evening. Amen. Father God, I uh, just thank you for your word. Please continue to deal with me from it. I pray that I might not treat these warnings and these instructions from you lightly. I pray for all of us that we would take personal holiness, personal holiness, what you have called us to, what you have saved us unto, Righteous living, pure living, godliness, striving, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. These things that you've saved us unto to reflect you in this world. I pray that we would take this seriously, pursuing holiness, disciplining ourselves for godliness, living in obedience, delighting in your commands. I pray that you may so work in us and I pray for any who are caught, who are, who are living and you've revealed that they have been disobedient in certain areas. I pray that you would cause them and bring them to repentance even now that they may turn and for any who need to bring it to the attention of leadership, may they do so. May you give them the strength and the courage and the burden to do so and Lord, may we see by your grace them restored and then brought into a close fellowship with you once again. I pray this all for the sake of the glory of the one who is the head and Lord of the church, Jesus Christ, for his sake. Amen. May the Lord bless you all uh, this evening. Mm -hmm.